So welcome to the Center for Global Development. My name is Sanjeev Gupta. I'm a senior policy fellow here. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, for a presentation and a discussion on fiscal policy challenges in Latin America. And thank you for coming uh, so early in the morning. Uh, and uh, before we commence the panel discussion, um, Alicia uh, Barcena will make a short presentation. Um, Alicia is the executive secretary of, uh, uh, of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and uh, she's held many senior positions at the UN. Uh, before she was under secretary general at New York and also chef of cabinet to the former secretary general, Kofi Annan. Um, so Alicia's presentation will be drawn from the latest fiscal panorama report prepared by the commission and so, Alicia, please close yours. Thank you so much. Good morning. <clears throat> it gives me great pleasure to be here this morning and, of course, to have such a great uh, panelists that are going to come at my presentation. So uh, thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you to, to the center for, for organizing this event for us. And of course, I am accompanied by Daniel Titelman and Noel, who are the two real authors of this uh, document with their teams, Ines Bustillo. And I'm very happy to see here Teresa Terminasi, and she's really the godmother of the, of the uh, fiscal seminar we organize every year. And this fiscal panorama actually is presented there. So this is the one we presented this year. And why I, I think uh, to, to be um, on the right spot, I would say that the regional context is very much attached to the global context as well. And the global context is getting very complicated, as we all know. Even we are, going to, we are expecting less growth this year from last year, probably around 2.6% at the global level which is less than one expect that was uh, forecasted initially. Also, the economic growth in Latin America remains very weak and with a lot of differences between countries. And of course, it's only, I would say, the driver of this growth is basically private consumption, which is, again, a, a sort of a vulnerability of the type of growth we have. Uh, and I think it's going to be, well, I'm going to show you a little bit later what are the figures. Fiscal consolidation has resulted in improvements, of course, in the primary balance, no question about it. But there has been a much smaller contribution to public spending. And that's also uh, a trade-off that the region has been paying. Public investment also remains the main variable of adjustment. And actually, public investment is so important because it's really the bridge between the short and the middle term. And this region has been, in a certain way, not putting enough attention to public investment. And, and despite these fiscal adjustments, the trajectory of the public debt is on the rise. I hope you can see the last line. But the, the, you can't, right? But it's not, it doesn't matter. But the thing is that the, the trajectory of the, you, you have it on the, on the other screens, 14 countries of the region have been increasing their public debt. When we talk about growth, this is what we, in early April, forecasted. We forecasted 1.3% for the region. But now, we are much more pessimistic. We believe that the growth in the region is going to be less than 1%. And, and, and the most interesting, not interesting, but the bad news is that it's going to be a synchronic decrease in all countries. It's not going to be one or the other. All the countries are going down in terms of their um, on their forecast. And um, as you can see, there are some economies that are worse. Uh oh, I, I, I made it. That are worse than others. You, can, you cannot see, but you will find out that Venezuela is minus 16 percent. Our forecast, the IMF is even more pessimistic. But the most preoccupying part, I think, is Argentina, you know, minus 1.8. But also, that economy is really very vulnerable. The, the, I would say the, the good ones are on the top Dominican Republic, Panama. Some of the Caribbean countries are quite good. Bolivia is, is a very interesting case, Bolivia, because Bolivia was one of the countries that remained uh, putting attention to public investment. And that was one of the reasons why they more or less have a, a good performance. But you can see that Central America, of course, is doing much better than South America. No, And South America is going to do worse, as I said, 
all of the countries will do worse this year. Now, what are the main components of the, of the fiscal situation uh, or the main message I would like to, to leave with you? First of all is that fiscal consolidation continues in Latin America and the ones who have made major efforts is the Caribbean. And the efforts they have done are very noticeable in the sense that here you can see that in, in Latin America, this is Latin America, this is the Caribbean, but in Latin America you will find that here the primary, let's say, uh, expenditure has gone down, yes, and the total revenues have been stable, and, but the total expenditure is 21%. So we have a little gap here, which is a minus 2.8, which is we have a primary, let's say, expenditure, we have a primary, I'm sorry, deficit here, minus 0.2%, but the global uh, deficit is minus 2.8 because it includes the payment of the interest rates. And here in the, in the Caribbean side, you will see that all of it goes up and they have made a tremendous effort to keep the primary expenditure uh, a little bit higher. And of course, the primary balance, 1.3, positive. And of course, with less, in certain way, global balance is minus 1.5 because, but they have made a tremendous effort basically related to the debt. Now, the public re uh, revenues have remained stable, but they are very insufficient to meet the development requirements. That's part of the problem. The problem is that when you see the, um, uh, here we are, when you see uh, Latin America, you will see that the tax revenues, 15.6% are stable, no? And other revenues are, are going a little bit downwards. When you go to South America, it's really preoccupying because it's going down. And when you go, I'm sorry, this is Central America and the Dominican Republic, and this is South America. So you will see tax revenues, other revenues, and this is in general the structure of the central governments. And here you see the Caribbean countries, the Caribbean countries which have made more efforts in, uh, in, in, in certain way to move into more revenues. Now, one of the major problems of Latin America and the Caribbean that we have been studying for the last years is tax evasion. I mean, we have a problem of fiscal consolidation, we have a problem indeed of, uh, of uh, expenditures, but here is the main problem. The problem is tax evasion. When you go to, uh, in a certain way, what is the estimated tax evasion in 2017? It's 6.3 of GDP. That's a lot of money. We're talking about $335 billion. So this is where the tax non-compliance of income tax is the, is the, is the one that we have here, 4% uh, here in income tax and 2.3% on, uh, on uh, value added tax. So adding these two, we have 6.3% of GDP, which is being tax evasion only. This side of the equation, we are so showing another thing, which is the goods trades misvoicing, the, which means misinvoicing, which means that a product, when a product leaves the country, let's say, that, that is undervalued. When it reach the country of destiny is overvalued. So somebody is losing here. And the loss we have calculated uh, more or less, or the cost of misinvoicing is $85 billion, more or less 1% of GDP, more or less. So, and then of course, the other element that we are highlighting in this particular report is the cost of, uh, I would say, of losses arising from evasion, as you can see, equivalent, they are equivalent to the projected revenues, or, or no, are they are even less than the projected revenues of the reforms that the countries have undertaken. All these countries of the region, all of them, no, have taken 67, 17 tax reforms between 2010 and 2015. So it's not that they have not undertaken tax reform, they have done it. And they have done it even, some of them have been very progressive on, for example, on taxing the income, um, income um, uh, rates and uh, taxing the income, uh, the IPRs. But the thing is that 
even with all these efforts that these countries have made, the expected additional revenues average 1%, which is more or less the cost of the misinvoicing on illicit flows, you know? But if you compare this with the, with the tax evasion, 6.3, I mean, it's more or less clear what the region needs to do. Now, the region needs, of course, to improve its tax structure. That's number one. If we see the, the tax structure of the, of the OECD, we will compare with the OECD. The blue one is OECD, and Latin America is the green. And you can see clearly that we are 5.3 points uh, distance between what OECD is able to, uh, to collect in terms of income tax versus 6.1% of the Latin American region. If we go to social security contributions, again, there is a big gap, 5.24 percentage points. The, and the, the one we are now entering into very much, and you can see we are highlighting it very much, is the property tax, that we have not been able to pull together a, a, an, ef, a, an efficient property right. And uh, the distance between us and the OECD is almost two times. So again, there is space here, space here, space here. Where we are more or less in the same vein, let's say, or in the same levels, is in the um, VAT, in, in the goods and services taxing. Now, uh, the other thing we are exploring in this report, which I hope you will find interesting, is what is the region thinking in terms of other sources of taxation? The case of the digital economy, for example, which everybody's thinking about it, and countries are doing very different things about the thing. So what we, what we have seen is that the current tax system is not, I would say, not up to the challenge of the digital economy. That's the problem, that the whole, let's say, design of the traditional tax system is weak. And, and it's favoring, because the tax system is more for goods and services or for income or for property, but we are, in a certain way, is in favor of the system of the erosion of tax revenues from the digital economy. And that's why even developed countries are trying to find ways on how to tax the Googles, the Apples, the, you see the Ubers and the Airbnbs and companies. In our region, eight countries have taken some initiatives in the field of taxation of digital services. Basically, the one who did it first was Peru. They were really very interesting because they did it very early in 2003. And the recent legal changes have come from Argentina, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Uruguay. And some that are implementing administrative measures are Chile, Mexico, and Paraguay. Now, this is not uniform. This is only starting. But there are two, I would say, two ways of collecting taxes today in the region, at least in these eight countries. Number one is tax measures focus on value-added taxes, again, to the consumer or to the intermediary. I mean, if you're buying a digital service, you're going to be taxed through your credit card, through the system, you're going to do it. But the other one, which I think is also interesting, is what Chile and, and Mexico are trying, which is a tax on the gross revenues of the companies. Now, this is becoming more difficult, but indeed, I think that's where we have to move at the end of the day. So I think it's urgent. One of the urgencies we have in Latin America and the world, I would say, is to improve the tax system for a growing digital economy that we don't know how we are going to, you know, how are we going to innovate on this, on this side. The other case we analyze in the report is the case of the environmental taxation. And that's also something that, as you know, is, is very much today in the discussion. Of course, Franz can tell us a little bit about Los Chalecos Amarillos and how they face the, you know, they wanted to put some overpricing or, or a, a sort of a tax into gasoline and poof, everybody was uh, very angry. But I have to say that in the case of the region, these are the countries that have put some sort of uh, environmental taxes, and this is the percentage of total revenues. And these taxes are basically uh, linked to fuel, you know, are linked to, to automotive, to cars, who's using cars that are more older or, or uh, newer or whatever. And of course, we also have, uh, uh, that is vehicle emissions and waste. Uh, Colombia and Ecuador are doing uh, a lot of uh, taxation on wastes. 
and also on water, Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Mexico. And indeed, the, um, the carbon tax is not being used in Latin America and the Caribbean. That's part of the problem. But yes, taxing on fuels is an issue that is coming up more and more. And you can see that in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, in terms of percentage of to total tax revenues, we are around 6.4, 17 countries, and 13% of GDP. So uh, this is something that is coming more and more, and, and we hope that it will be a, a good, a good um, place. And the other one is the uh, taxes that are motivated by public health, for example, alcohol and tobacco. We, th we think that these two types of taxes, with, together with others, with sugar, for example, you know, the, the drinks with sugar and all this, people are more open for these taxes. We have found that, in, in a certain way, the community, in a certain way, is more, more favoring these type of taxes because it's related to their health. So there are some countries that have, have done this already, like, for example, Argentina and tobacco. Tobacco is, I think, the most popular in, in Argentina and in Chile and, and Venezuela, of course. But you can see that most countries are either looking at this, putting more taxes on this, and this is something that is very interesting. Now, on the side of expenditure, which I think is the other side of the equation in taxing, is we have to look at two things. First of all, the, the, of course, there is a relative stability on the, uh, in a certain way, on the primary current uh, uh, expenditure, no? 22, which is stable. What is growing is the, the capital expenditure is the one that we believe it should be growing. This is the Caribbean. But look at Latin America, it's going down. And what is going up is the interest rates. So in the expenditure, we are in the primary current expenditure, we are going down. We are going uh, down also on the capital expenditure, and we are going up in the interest rates, contrary to what's happening in the Caribbean. But the most worrisome side is here. If you see the curves, you will see that there was a point in 2011, more or less, when our capital expenditure was 4.2 and our interest rates were 1.7, was low. As we were talking with you, Nancy, devil, the, the, debt of the, le uh, the level of the debt was very low in that, in, that, in that moment. But today, unfortunately, the majority of the countries, as I said before, 14, have increased their debt. And the interest payments are going up, and of course, the capital expenditures are going down. So that's the problem. That's a if debt could be used for investment, that'd be different. But if we are using debt for current expenditures, that's the problem. Now, uh, and, and we also believe that the cost of social protection is, is very much linked, and it's going to be linked to the demographic transition. And, and this is going to put an increasing pressure on the, on the side of expenditure. If you can see, for example, the cases of, you can see here in the case of social protection, look at Brazil. Brazil went up from 6.7 to 11.2. And the case of, um, of Brazil, uh, this is Brazil, I'm sorry, this is Argentina. So in any event, I mean, they are going up, of course, all of them. This is health spending. But there are two things here. One is that people are getting older, so social protection is going to be very important. And secondly, the nature of the epidemiology is changing because we are going to non-transmissible um, um, uh, say this? chronic, chronic. Uh, so those chronic are more costly than the previous uh, occasion. So that's where we are. Now, the other element that we analyze very profoundly for the first time, I guess, is what is the, what is the preferential tax treatments? We call it los privilegios, <laughs> the culture of privileges. Who is enjoying this? Should we review them? They are cases that we should definitely review because, of course, we have tax expenditures as a share of central uh, governments, and on average, they are equivalent to 17% of budgetary expenditures. So we should look at this. Where are they going? Are they going, for example, 
for VAT. This is the level, more or less, the composition of tax expenditures in Colombia. 83% go to, to VAT, 17% to income tax. But country by country. So what we are suggesting is that each country should look at their tax expenditure, the foregone revenue. We don't mean to say that you should dismantle it, but just why don't we analyze if they are really being, let's, let's say, cost efficient in terms of investment or in terms of social expenditures. We have to look into this. And if we do it properly, we might be then able to see if these tax expenditures, and of course tax evasion, by the way, could be used to achieve the sustainable development goals. We only put here three examples. Of course, the example of uh, the, the, the renewable energy, because we really believe, for example, that the region is moving very quickly towards renewable energy, particularly South America. And Eric, you can, you can attest to that, because really Chile, for example, is moving very quickly to renewable energy with the private sector, not with public investment. So, but if we have the right incentives and if we have accelerated depreciation, deductions of tax, I mean, honestly, this tax expenditure should be looked at with a new lens. And we believe that uh, the, the Sustainable Development Goals is a way to do this. Deduction or credits for clean production, or for forest plantations, or for low carbon consumer goods, that is, tax incentives for the adoption of clean technology. I mean, how to reorganize the, uh, the, the, the vision on this. And as I said before, and with this I'm starting to close, is that the debt um, in, the, in the countries has gone upwards. In spite of the consolidation efforts, you can see that uh, this debt has gone really up and as I said, if that debt could be used for investment, that wouldn't be so bad. But the problem is that debt associated with the reduction of the primary expenditures, I mean, maybe it's, it's badly used. That's what, I'm, uh, what's what, that's what we are concerned about. And you can see how the debt went down at some point, but how it's going up again, reaching some of the levels we used to have in the 50s, uh, I'm sorry, in the 2000 and so forth. Of course, one of the countries that we need to look carefully is Argentina, right? Argentina is 86% of GDP. It was 95. And what is 86? Not, not for the right reasons. <laughs> it's because the denominator has changed. Inflation is going up. So that's why um, it's not for the right reasons. But, but you can see that Argentina and Brazil are the most indebted countries in, in between these two years, but all of them have increased their debt, their, their public debt. Um, and in, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, you see the challenge of the middle income country. You know, the problem we have is that we are putting the SDGs financing on the hands of national governments. We are saying mobilize domestic resources as the main source to finance the SDGs, which I think is not, it's not gonna be the only thing we can do. It cannot be. So, because if you see Latin America, the, the tax revenues on 2017, percentage of GDP, 21%, versus 34 of the developed countries. Even the Caribbean is better than us. In, in the, I mean, the Caribbean are doing much better than Latin America. If you go to public expenditures, you will see that Latin America is around 12%, SDGs will require much more additional resources. Developed countries are already investing 29% only in these matters, which is education, health, social protection, and infrastructure. So our gaps, and this is something we are very clearly saying to the international community. If you think that Latin America and the Caribbean are middle income countries and they are going to be graduated because they are doing better, no, we are not doing better. We have very critical gaps, and that's why we are working on this concept of development in transition. We brought some material for you on this regard. So, in conclusion, this report is offering three sets of recommendations. Uh, two, of course, all of this is attached to Agenda 2030, which we believe has to enhance the mobilization of fiscal resources. But first, we have to broaden the fiscal space. So the first thing to do is reduce tax evasion. That's number one. 
and that has to do with the administration of the, uh, of the fiscal institutions. Adopt environmental and health taxes on the and the digital economy. Rethink tax expenditures and strengthen taxation on personal income and property. So those areas in which we identify where we can probably broaden the fiscal space. The second one is how to increase the effectiveness of public spending and investment. And that is, we believe that public expenditures and the social expenditure should be protected in two fronts. Let me put an example. The cash transfers in Latin America, the very successful program of cash transfers, cost to the economy 0.33% of GDP. 0.3% of GDP. Please, you know? And the tax, let me, put, let, me, let me make a contrast with the Mexican case. The tax expenditures of Mexico, those privilegios, are 3.3 of GDP, 10 times more. And then if we consider the costs of the labor inclusion programs, is 0.4%. 0.4%. So again, we're talking about 0.7% that we can do things very efficiently on social and labor inclusion. And of course, how can we orient public investment towards innovative technologies based on natural resources, energy efficiency, and so forth? And of course, public-private agreements to boost infrastructure and renewable energy. We are doing a report that will come soon. I hope you will be interested on this. Where is the money? That's the name of the report, isn't it, Daniel? Where is the money in the world? No, because the money is not being invested. The money is somewhere, you know? It's in the actives, it's in somewhere else. So we are trying to see where is the money, and, and, and we can't find it. We, 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 we have found it, some of them, but anyway. And then, of course, we need to redesign fiscal incentives for industrial policies. We insist on a new form of industrialization to go towards a, an environmental push. And finally, we believe that there has to be some regional multilateral space to close policy asymmetries. We are not going to make it if we cannot forge regional and global uh, agreements to reduce evasion avoidance and illicit flows. You know, we need to, to tango, you know. If tax evasion is happening here, somebody, somewhere is receiving this money. So we need their agreement. Reduce harmful tax competition. That is, if the companies come to exploit the same mineral in the Dominican Republic and in Peru and in Chile, why don't they pay the same? To, the, to, to, you know, why don't we level up instead of raise to the bottom, which is what's happening today. And reduce global asymmetries and strengthen dialogue with transnational corporations. We definitely need, these, these are the key players of the international community. So thank you very much. I hope I have given you an overview of this panorama. Sanjev, thank you so much. And I, I hope you will find it interesting. Alicia, you, you're sitting on sure, the sure, side. Sure. Yeah. On the, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So thank you, Alicia, for uh, for an excellent uh, presentation. Um, so I'm not going to. We have a very uh, impressive panel. I'm not going to introduce them in detail, but. We have kept the bios of each of the uh, panelists on the on your seats. So let me um, give some brief introduction. Uh, next to Alicia is Nancy Perstall. I mean, she doesn't need introduction in this place. Uh, she is the uh, president emeritus of CGD and senior fellow here, um, and uh, and an avid follower of Latin America uh, from her days in IDB. So, uh, and then next to her is uh, Marcelo Estavo. He's a global director for macroeconomics, investment, and trade at the bank. Uh, he's worked a number of places before, including uh, private sector, Brazilian government, and IMF. So, uh, thank you for coming. And 
And then uh, next to him is uh, um, Eric Perado Herrera. He is the chief economist for IDB. Um, he's been a professor at, uh, in one of the universities in Chile before he joined uh, and has uh, participated in a number of government uh, committees before then. Uh, and the last panelist on my right is uh, Jorge Goldos. He's assistant director from uh, IMF's Western Hemisphere Department. He's responsible for producing the regional economic outlook uh, for the IMF. And therefore, he's uh, the person who can provide some input uh, in the deb discussion that we will have today. So with this, um, let me start uh, with some questions for different panelists. Um, and I will start with Nancy first. Um, one of the issues which didn't really come out uh, in the presentation, but it is in the report, is the issue of uh, high income inequality in, uh, in the region. Though it has come down a bit in the last uh, uh, decade or so, it remains high and it's, uh, it has consequences for growth and people's well-being. So the, and the issue is, what can the fiscal policy do um, to deal with this uh, income distribution issues since fiscal policy is a key tool uh, to deal with it. And here, perhaps you can focus a bit more on the tax instruments. Nancy. Right, okay. Well, let me start by thanking Alicia and colleagues from CEPAL. It's really an amazing to think you do this every single year. And it was a great presentation, brought out so many key issues. So I learned even listening from the present to the presentation. Um, but Sanjeev told me ahead of time he would ask me this question. <laughs> um, so I want to say three things on the issue of uh, tax policy and inequality. The first is something that's been brought out by the work of Nora Lustig, who's a non-resident fellow here at the center. Many of you know her commitment to equity uh, index project. And it's a simple point. <clears throat> Their work in 30 or 40 countries shows countries that rely primarily on the VAT or other consumption, other consumption type taxes, but it's essentially the VAT, um, have a problem, which is that the VAT tends to immiserate low income people, to send them lower in cash terms, and to put people into poverty. And the work of CEQ brings that out, particularly for the poor, the extreme poor. But other work that I've done with Nora in the past suggests it's really scarier in many ways for the next group of people that I call the strugglers, who are above the poverty line but far from being in the secure middle class. Those people pay a lot of consumption taxes. And for many of them, it means household income per capita falling from, say, 5 or $6 a day down toward $3 a day. So this is really dangerous politically, in my view, as well as dangerous in terms of the ter terrific harm it's doing. And one of the things that's so frustrating for me as an American, where we have it's a huge personal income tax, uh, huge in terms of total revenue, maybe too much, <clears throat> some people say, compared to consumption taxes, People know, you learn here when you work at summer camp and you're 14 years old and you get your first paycheck and out of it comes social security and some income tax. So the, I see the political problem as partly that people don't really know how much they're paying when they pay consumption tax. So that's the first point. Second point is about personal income tax. Um, I have other numbers from those you presented, and my guess is you're right. But the point is generally that it's just too low to, in Latin America. It's just, and this is the tax that can be progressive. Um, you know, we have Elizabeth Warren invoking the work of Piketty, mm -hmm. right, and Zuckman, and pushing for a wealth tax. That's maybe a next step. Or, simultaneous step with having a personal income tax. And we know 
that there are lots of ways to enforce the personal income tax. You just have now in the digital system, you can see who owns a Mercedes. You can see who owns a big house and must therefore you know, be understating his or her income. So I'd love to see a SAPAL report that just looks at personal income tax and the property tax. In both cases, Latin America should set a goal as a region of getting at least halfway to where the OECD countries are. In both cases, it's possible. It's possible in Latin America. You have there the technical capacity. And I think the politics, although they're very difficult, can be partly overcome through the technical capacity and the, and the goodwill of so many people in Latin America who are the bureaucrats in the system. So please set some sort of a goal on the income tax and the property tax. Of course, that would reduce, well, then you have your tax expenditures and many other issues of tax evasion. But these two taxes, you know, it's all about doing the groundwork sooner. It might take five years, but set some sort of a goal. Where should the region be, you know, by 2025 on the percentage of tax revenue that comes from those progressive, inherently progressive taxes? This would be, you know, a it's, look, it's, it's putting Elizabeth Warren, <laughs> you know, ahead in the polls for have just the idea of taxing income, high income and wealth. <clears throat> Let me stop there yeah, for now. Thank you, Nancy. Um, let can me... I, can I give you sure. an important fact? Just sure, to sure, complement, sure. because I always like to repeat this. When you compare Gini coefficients in Latin America and the Caribbean and OECD countries, the Gini coefficients before taxes and subsidies are more or less the same. But... but after taxes and subsidies, Gini coefficients in OECD countries, the yeah. reduction is very significant. But in Latin America, it's very tiny. So it's not only a matter of increasing taxes, but also a matter of what Alicia mentioned, tax evasion and leakages everywhere. So this is, I think, a fact that we have to, to take care of from, from the basis. Thank you, Eric. Actually, uh, for the OECD countries, the Gini after taxes and transfers goes down by one third. Right. Uh, whereas in the case of uh, Latin America, it goes down by three or four percentage points. Exactly. So it tells you the fiscal policy is not that very effective. Exactly. So let me now turn to Jorge. Um, one of the points that Alicia brought out in the presentation was the fact <coughs> that the debt to GDP ratio in the region is rising. Interest payments, uh, if I remember the number correctly, on average standard about 2.7 percentage points of GDP. Uh, mm -hmm. Now that is squeezing some of the productive spending as Alicia talked about. So what can one do as a fiscal, from the fiscal point of view as a strategy to introduce more sustainability in the policy? What is that one needs to, to do in the, in the medium term? Well, thanks, Sanjeev, and thanks to the CGD and CEPAL for the invitation. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background uh, on, on the numbers. I mean, you, you, you show the debts for uh, central government. Our measure of uh, a broader measure and for the whole Latin America shows that debt had gone uh, from 49% of GDP in 2013 to 67% uh, uh, in 2018. That's an increase of 18 percentage points of GDP. Uh, and it's above Maastricht, okay? We are at 67, so there is little uh, escape to the need for consolidation. We do have to consolidate. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one third of that increase in debt is due to valuation uh, with the collapse of commodity prices. Uh, a lot of countries saw their currencies depreciate, and that increases the debt to GDP ratios. But there were also uh, increases, pro cyclical increases in, in government spending. Uh, and, and those have to be taken care of. Now, as Alicia was mentioning, already there was a reduction, uh, sorry, an increase in one percentage point of the primary surplus uh, in the region. 
And, uh, but we, we see that uh, in order to lower the burden of interest, you have to lower the debt. And to lower the debt, you need higher primary surpluses. And like it or not, uh, we uh, estimate that in the next uh, five years, the region has to increase primary surpluses by around 2% of GDP on average. Now, the stories are different for different groups of countries, and if there is, any, if there is something that we uh, agree and we were discussing uh, before coming to the room, is the, the great diversity that we have in the region. So there is no one size fits all to uh, conduct these adjustments and lower the debt and make room room for uh, public investment. Uh, so let me go basically concentrating four groups of countries. The first one, uh, ones are Argentina and Ecuador, mm -hmm. uh, two countries where the fund has programs now. Uh, and these are two countries that definitely need a fast uh, and strong uh, adjustment. Why is that? I mean, if you take a little bit of a perspective and go be before the, the commodity price super cycle and you look at government spending in 2003 compared to two, 2018, uh, in Argentina, uh, government spending was 20% of GDP. Now it's about 35% of GDP. Okay. In Ecuador, it was 15% of GDP, now it's 30% of GDP. So both countries had roughly an increase of one percentage point of GDP over the last 15 years. Okay? And they lost access to markets. So that's a very clear signal that you have to adjust and you have to do it fast. Okay? So uh, in these countries, uh, the fund programs have an adjustment in the primary of north of five percentage points in three years, which is, is strong. Uh, and as a result of what I mentioned, just mentioned on the level of government spending, it has to be done mostly contracting uh, spending, and um, probably the balance would be three and a half uh, reduction in spending, one and a half to two percent increase in taxation. Now, uh, of course, investment is going to suffer in that process, but I wanted to bring to your attention as well that these two programs from the IMF, these are standby programs in which we have a, the fund has imposed a floor on social spending. And in some cases, both for Ecuador and Argentina, increases in the coverage uh, of some of the social programs. So it's, it's not that the fund uh, puts a, a floor on, on net international reserves. Now we have floors mm -hmm. on social spending, which I think is a great addition to our toolkit. Um, so moving to another group, um, the second group is, is not a group, it's the largest country in the region, which is Brazil. Okay. And Brazil, uh, as, as we were seeing, has a debt to GDP ratio of uh, around 78% of GDP. And uh, it is pretty clear that they need a pension reform. Okay, so the, the, the pension reform, the fund estimates that is going to be some pension reform is going to be approved before the end of the year. But that is a necessary condition for sustainability, but not a sufficient condition. Okay, so even if they pass a relatively strong pension reform, uh, there are other expenditures that are going to be take, have to be taken care of. Uh, among them, uh, wages in the public sector. Um, some recent fund studies show that the wages in the private sector have a huge premium relative to the private sector uh, in Brazil, and, and that's definitely an imbalance that needs to be corrected. But even with a constitutional fiscal rule that uh, that caps. Uh, growth uh, in, in, in government spending to the, the CPI, so it's constant in real terms, that gives you an adjustment of half percentage points of, uh, of GDP. So in, in that context, the debt of Brazil would go from 78% to 96% in 2024. So that is definitely mm -hmm. non, not sustainable, uh, has to be take, taken care of. Um, the third group of countries is Colombia and Mexico, two countries that have uh, relatively good macro, uh, strong macro frameworks. Uh, both have uh, another type of program from the IMF, a precautionary program that is called the FCL, the Flexible Credit Line. But if you look at these countries, they have managed to preserve sustainability, but with uh, doing a tax reform every two years or, or, or so. Okay, um, in the case of Mexico, it wasn't that frequent. Uh, Mexico debt to GDP has hovered around 53, 55%. And um, uh, following one of the tax reforms that uh, Alicia showed before, Mexico managed to have a primary surplus of around 1%. Uh, that helps 
sort of contain the, the, the sustainability problem. Uh, the new administration uh, has shown signals of uh, sticking to fiscal prudence with a strong budget this year, strong parameters for next year, but still we don't know uh, all of the details on, on how they're going to accomplish those targets. Okay. So Colombia, as I said before, Colombia has had uh, a tax reform every two years since 1990, okay? Uh, and Colombia has a very complex tax code that needs to be simplified. Um, they just passed another tax reform um, last year, and, and this is a growth-friendly reform, but that is going to complicate a little bit the achievement of the structural fiscal rule. So um, it's, it's good, I mean, the question was, uh, how do we achieve fiscal sustainability to return to growth? Uh, Colombia is trying to do it with uh, this uh, tax reform. Now there was a big opposition to one of the uh, big chunks of, of that reform. We can talk about those later in, in, in my second intervention if you want. And finally, we have the star, the star growth performers, Chile, Peru, uh, Panama, and Paraguay. Okay. Chile is well known that uh, has had a sustainable fiscal position for more than 30 years. Uh, th that allowed them to use fiscal policy counter-cyclically after the Lehman crisis. But I want to highlight the case of Peru. Peru uh, faced uh, the El Nino problem and the Odebrecht uh, implications in 2017 and was able to engage in a strong counter-cyclical fiscal policy. So growth went down from around 4% to 2.7, and the year after that, they were back growing at 4%, okay? And, and, and if, if, if you, if you want to have a sustainable and inclusive growth, you have to have that kind of uh, counter-cyclical fiscal policy so that uh, the private sector sees that the fiscal is not an issue. I mean, you, you, you can concentrate uh, uh, on, on growth. So I'm going to stop there. Not to just Thank you. Um, uh, Marcelo, um, uh, Alicia presented us with numbers on tax evasion. Uh, in, and the point is that it is exceptionally high in the region. And uh, it is coming largely from income tax side and VAT side. And so what... Um, Mayors could the countries take uh, to close this uh, gap that they are observing in, um, in loss in tax revenues? Thanks, Sanjeev. First of all, let me, let me thank for the invitation to be in this panel with so many uh, illustrious regional experts. It's great to kind of turn my attention to my home region, if you want to <laughs> say, for, for at least for the, for the uh, time of this panel. And it's great to be here in Nancy's house. I mean, that's her room. <laughs> so, um, so it's, not, it's the first time I think I speak uh, in a room and the owner of the room is beside me. <laughs> anyway, I like so, paying taxes. <laughs> so anyway, so, so it's a big privilege. So um, let me, before like George, Jorge mentioned, before this, um, this event, I was remarking how, how the region is, is different. Uh, you know, the countries in the region are, are so different from each other. So everything we say here needs to be taken with care, and then it's important to focus on key groups, and I really appreciate George's um, intervention, that kind of focus on different groups. Here will be a bit general, because, you know, the time is short, but we can go back to country-specific uh, topics. First, uh, it is true, the, uh, CEPAL has estimated that a tax evasion is about 4% of GDP in personal and corporate in income taxes in the region and about 2% in VAT. So that is, that is an issue and that we should be talking about. I have a little bit of a different take, and let me break down on why that happened, break down by groups of, of uh, taxes, let's say. So if you look at corporate income tax, the region has higher uh, tax rates than most other regions. That's quite clear in the data. If you do a... a, a, a so a simple correlation, do a chart where you have in the left-hand side corporate income tax rates and the, um, in the uh, uh, y-axis and the y in the x-axis you have log of GDP. You see there is a negative relationship between these two. And then if you fit a simple regression line, you see the countries in Latin America tend to be way above that relationship in the sense that they have much higher corporate income tax rates than their level of income would predict. That's particularly true in Argentina and in Brazil, with tax rates of about 35%. And 
And we could have a whole conversation about what this implies uh, for the region, for those countries, in the context that you have a big player like the US doing a major corporate tax reform and what this country should do to respond to that. But that's, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so my view on, on that particular issue, on corporate, tax, uh, corporate income tax rates, they are just too high in the region. And there is evasion because tax are just too high. Uh, there are lots of nuances to that. The regional average, if you look at total tax and contribution rates as a, as a share of profits, the regional average is about 46.7%. If you look at the OECD, for, you know, uh, it's about 39%. And of course, there's a lot of country variation. You have Argentina, Bolivia, Colombia, Brazil with rates of 65% uh, or higher as a percent of profits. Um, if you look at measures of efficiency, how you're collecting these taxes, the time required to pay taxes across the world in Latin America is, is also startling the difference. The region average is about 33, uh, 330 hours per year in, in Latin America. Say for the ECD is 159, and for all the other regions is below Latin America. For Brazil, I mean, it's, you basically take almost 2,000 hours per year to do your corporate income taxes. When I was debt diminished in Brazil, it's remarkable the number of people that would come to me saying, in my firm, multinational corporations, I have this, this subsidiary in Sao Paulo, and uh, I basically have 200 lawyers working to do taxes here. In the US, I have two part-time. Right? So, so the difference is stark. So I think that's something that needs to be, uh, even though I think, um, say, Policing is important, and I'm going to talk about the other types of taxes. It's important to realize how distorted is corporate income taxes in, in, in these countries. For instance, in Brazil, we don't pay a tax on dividend distribution. So there's a whole, I mean, uh, I think agenda there. There's lower corporate income taxes and raise uh, dividend uh, tax on dividends. They all tax capital uh, ownership in some level, but um, it would be a much more uh, sane uh, tax system. On VAT, if you do the same type of uh, kind of relationship, you see a positive relationship. If you put VAT tax rates on one side and log of GDP down, apparently countries that have higher income tend to have higher VAT rates. Here the region is kind of distributed around these lines. Some countries are above, some countries are below. And uh, some countries like Brazil don't have VAT tax, have basically very distortive indirect taxes. There is a whole discussion there on how to, how to change that. If you measure VAT C efficiency, then basically measure the ratio of actual VAT collection to a notional maximum potential collection, you can see this determined basically by, by two factors. One is a policy induced inefficiency due to exemptions and other policy actions that make the base smaller than, say, total consumption. And there is administrative efficiency due to inadequate enforcement of the law. And Alicia did a very good job going over the, these factors. I'm focusing much more in my current job on Africa for, for many reasons, because it's the biggest development issue that the world has right now. So if I compare Latin America to Africa, uh, sea efficiency in, Latin, in Africa on average is 0.33, it's quite low. In Latin America it's 0.6, it's low, but it's, it's I think as a middle income region, uh, it's, it's kind of about uh, maybe some type of ballpark. So if, if Average sea efficiency in Latin America is about 6%, and the region collect on average 6% of GDP in VAT taxes. Then the potential VAT collection will be 10% of GDP. That's Alicia's point, you know. Let's act on that and see if we can uh, improve uh, collections and, and make sure that, um, you know, uh, and, and that and that's, is basically the agenda that also goes together with uh, how to fight informality and all this that, you know, is a whole agenda of discussion that I think is important to talk in this, in this context. The last tax that we should look at is individual income tax rates. And like Nancy said, it tends to be lower in Latin America. And uh, so if you think in terms of optimal tax policy, it's kind of a very perverse region because what you would like is to have uh, the income, the income uh, tax um, side be kind of correcting for whatever distributive uh, effect that you have from having say higher uh, VAT tax rates. And this is not quite happening. Uh, there's a whole issue, and uh, I'm glad Alicia mentioned the issue of social security reform and, and that we, I'm, 
I hope you come back to the topic. There's the issue of equity. It's a very, uh, sorry to be a bit blunt, but it's a very perverse region. It's a region where you have basically a social security system that protects the rich, basically, in particular in Brazil. So, and that goes also with the tax system. So something needs to be done here. This needs to be a much fairer tax system, needs to have much more of a focus on redistribution, uh, needs to be much more involved on environmental uh, taxation. I'm creating a group in the, in the economic side of the World Bank that does basically the macroeconomics of climate change. We're investing a lot of research time on thinking about how to do environmental tax reforms, how to really match those objectives, you know, like I joke and it's like, uh, we're all for fighting poverty, but we need still a world to live on. Otherwise, you know, there's no people to, to bring out of poverty. So, um, so the, all these issues are very related to each other, and if we had time, I would go back to it. So in terms of how the policy issues, um, there are many ways. I mean, you need to act on policy gaps and compliance gaps. You need to eliminate tax exemptions, reduce the number of different tax rates. There are several studies showing how these tax exemptions are uh, not just distortive, but just unfair. You know, whoever gets the biggest exemption has, has the higher political power in, in the country. Uh, tax policy could be more predictable. There's some arguments for making maybe a slightly more counter-cyclical, so have fiscal uh, uh, adjustment, fiscal, uh, automatic fiscal multipliers also work in terms of playing a little bit with some tax um, parameters. You need to be careful not to keep changing parameters, but maybe have an income tax credit that automatically would help even more the tax system to stabilize the economy, in particular directed to the poorer part of the population. And of course, the use of modern technology to support equity administration, like Alicia mentioned. After if there's time, I, can, I would describe a bunch of uh, research that we have done using quasi-experiments to see how you, what you do to increase compliance uh, um, in corporate tax uh, payments. And there's a very interesting study on Costa Rica that you've done that is basically uh, showing that if you send emails to, to companies, with some inf true information about, you know, I know you, you bought this machinery, so I kind of know what your level of corporate profits is, so you better pay taxes. There's a, a big response to that. If you show the tax machine, show they have some information by crossing information, the response is significant. So there are techniques that countries can do to increase uh, compliance as well. And let me stop here. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Marcelo. Uh, Eric. Um, we heard uh, uh, from Jorge about the increase in spending in a number of countries. The spending uh, has indeed gone up. And uh, then we also heard from Alicia that the yeah. revenue to GDP ratio is stuck. So, um, which means that we have to act on the spending side. Uh, so, what can one do to improve the efficiency of spending to generate space for more productive spending? Thank you, Sanjeev. First of all, thank you to the Center for Global Development for the invitation. It's the, the first time here, so it's both an honor and a pleasure to share some ideas regarding fiscal policies. And second of all, of all um, congratulations to CLAC and, and Alicia for, for the report. We share a lot of the assessment, but also the recommendations of it, uh, because we also have a couple of flagships in relation to uh, public policies, so we share a lot of the suggestions and recommendations that uh, CLAD uh, had in, in that report. So regarding efficiency, I think um, it's important the discussion that we had before in terms that expenditure has increased a lot. Uh, we have this good back example of Argentina that there's an increase of 15-17% of GDP and this in addition to, to the basis, so it's a huge number, around 35%. And the problem of this, at least we, we have two, revenues are not growing at the same rate. So for instance, I, I had a mission recently to Central America and Colombia. I have discussion, for instance, before the elections in, in Guatemala, and I asked several think tanks and the private sector uh, and, and the government officials, what are the tax policies that the candidates are offering? And you know what happened? They laughed at me. They said, no, candidates shouldn't say anything about taxes. They make uh, promises regarding spending, but they don't have the other part of the expenditure side. 
So that's a, a, an issue, and I think it's a structural issue of Latin America and the Caribbean that we need to look at permanent expenditure, but at the same time, we have to look at permanent income. So that's one, one issue uh, regarding the, this asymmetry. And the second one is inefficiencies. And I would say there are two main inefficiencies. One is related to tax, and the other one is related to allocation. And regarding tax uh, inefficiency, recently we issued a flagship on, on public expenditure, and there are three main components that we have to take a look. Transfers, the procurement, and, and the wage bill. So if we, for, for instance, consider social transfers, we include conditional transfers, non-contributory pensions, energy subsidies, and tax expenditures, all of them have leakages in terms that they are not targeted to the poor. So the exemptions also goes to, to the rich. And this is a huge problem. Let, let me give you some numbers. On cash transfers and non-contributory pensions, leakages are in order of 43%. 43%, so it's a huge number. Energy subsidies, you know the number? 82%, 82%. Tax expenditure leakages are the largest with 84%. So if you sum up all the uh, social transfers in terms of the leakages, uh, it's around 1.7% of GDP. So this is the first component. The second component is a procurement of goods and services. So if we consider inefficiencies related to corruption in government acquisitions, and the number uh, in terms of leakages is 1.4% of GDP. So we already have 2.1% of GDP only in these two components. And if we add up to this uh, inefficiency, inefficiency in the wage bill, because if you compare, for instance, low-skilled workers in the public sector vis-a-vis -vis the private sector, the difference is, is very substantial. It's around 23% in terms of uh, wages. The leakages on, on that uh, topic, on that item, is 1.2%. So if you add up all the three components, we have leakages around 4.3%, 4.4% of GDP, which is a huge number. It's $220 billion only in leakages. So I think Alicia mentioned the, the, the tax evasion component, but we shouldn't forget about the leakages that we have in the tax inefficiency, inefficiency component. The other one is re, re, in relationship to uh, allocation. So Alicia also mentioned the, the idea of that capital expenditures were decreasing in time, and of course current expenditures were uh, increasing in time. So that's, that's a problem, that the location is changing, and this was a huge problem because of the commodity boom. During the commodity boom, we have, of course, an increase in revenues, but a huge increase in current expenditures, and that, that's a problem. And that's why we're trying to sell, to, to sell the idea that we need to increase public expenditure, we need to increase uh, infrastructure, but we have to find, for instance, a, a specific uh, fiscal rules to avoid these <coughs> changes when you need to decrease uh, deficits uh, because it has to have an impact on, on, on current expenditure but not in uh, uh, public um, capital expenditures. So I would say those are the, the main components in terms of how to look in terms of inefficiencies with the, with the current expenditure. Thank you, Eric. Um, before we open the discussion, uh, Alicia, would you um, like to comment on any of these things, or should we open that, and then you can, what would you prefer? I would prefer to, to hear okay. everybody, and okay. then we can okay. take Very some good. conclusions. Uh, so let me, uh, since we are left with about 25 minutes of time, so we should use this time to uh, solicit questions from the floor. So Vito, uh, but Vito, the f uh, microphone is coming. Anybody else? Um, okay, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed very much the presentation, but I had a strange feeling that uh, I'd uh, gone to sleep, I'd slept for 50 years, then I'd woken <laughs> up, and nothing had changed. You know, my first job when I was a student at Harvard was in the, in the 
OAS joint tax program of the OAS, IPP, and the UN. You know. And the main objective of that program, which is in the Alliance for Progress, was to get more income taxes and reduce evasion. Nothing has changed. No. And that's all. I've always been puzzled why Latin America has been so successful in collecting value added taxes, but so unsuccessful in collecting income taxes. And I've always challenged the institutions that are involved with Latin America to stud, study that issue. And I, can, I wrote a paper for the Wilson Center which dealt with this issue, but I, I've never seen a study of that. On the e question of whether the value of the tax is bad for the poor, I want to mention that the country with the best Gini coefficient in the world is also the country which collects the most from the value of the tax, which is Denmark. You know? So that uh, the question is not how much you collect from value of the tax, but how you collect it. If you introduce yeah, yeah. lots of uh, uh, differentiation, as the Mexican used to do, then uh, you have a lot of problem. You know, you have to collect money with a flat rate on everything. The poor will still not pay much of it because the poor buy things from the informal sector, from the countryside. That they are always an exemption for for a certain mm -hmm. goods. So that's a really a non-starter. Another point I want to make very quickly, and then I'll stop, is on, on wealth taxes. You know, the idea that wealth tax will solve the problem is a non-starter. Wealth has become very liquefi liquefied and very globalized. You know, if you are rich you now, you don't have a wealth in a house. You have wealth in bonds, in, in uh, deposits in the US, and elsewhere, there are estimates now how much wealth there is in the world which is not reported, you know? So that the wealth is a non-starter. You know, I would not waste my time on that. Value the, the property taxes have been consistently unsuccessful all over the world. In fact, Italy de decided to abolish it completely some years ago. So the question is income tax, you know, and that's really where the issue should be. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I, there are so many issues that uh, Alicia and the panel raised that uh, deserve, uh, you know, longer and, and more detailed discussion. But I, I would just like to uh, um, stress that. Well, I, I disagree a little bit with uh, my former boss and great friend, uh, uh, Vito, uh, about uh, the scope for, uh, for improving the um, situation in terms of uh, tax collections in, uh, in the, uh, the, the uh, region. I think that the main obstacle there is not a technical obstacle, it's really a political obstacle. It's the fact that you know, privileges have name and last name, so to speak. And, and the fact that uh, the, uh, to some extent, the imbalance between uh, direct and indirect taxes, it reflects policies and it reflects also the fact that the economies are so, um, the Latin American economies are typically so um, sort of fraught with uh, informality. So the question is, uh, I, I see tax reform as sort of a part of a set of, of reform. You cannot take tax reform in, in isolation because it will not be effective. I, I think that it will, if you don't change some of the institutions and some of the political uh, institutions that bear on uh, the composition of, of the taxes, it will be very difficult to, to make uh, a, um, uh, a dent really on the current, uh, the current situation. Uh, so my question really to, to uh, Alicia is, what do you think should be done uh, to improve the politics of, of tax reform? Uh, I entirely agree with many of the recommendations that I made here, particularly, for example, on uh, you know, environmental taxes and uh, on uh, taxes to corrective taxes and so on. But the big question of the imbalance between direct and indirect taxes or between consumption and income taxes, uh, in my view, remains essentially political. So what do you think could be done to, to improve on that? Thank you. Any more questions uh, from the floor? Yes, from the left. I'll come to the right, please. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for 
inspiring, uh, a great conversation. Um, you know, when, when, when I have had these discussions with ministers of finance uh, across the region, um, one, one issue is generating the tax policies to be able to collect you know, money from different sources to be applicable uh, to healthcare measures or to improving healthcare outcomes. But then the other, the other aspect is really to find the mechanisms for those resources to be actually executed and implemented. So, I mean, there's, um, uh, ministers of finance are very timid at the defining earmarking, for example, solutions that will guarantee that actually um, some of the, those resources will be um, effectively implemented. So, so my question is how do we, what's, what's your take or what's your position on managing uh, kind of the disparity between generating the resources and impository measures to actually channel uh, or improving uh, strategies on, on healthcare outcomes and actually making sure that that money will be destined uh, for those purposes. There's a question from that side. Hi, um, I wanted to ask, after the cases of Lava Hato, Odebrecht that happened in the region, and in general the sentiment of, cor of corruption, and the lack of uh, trust in the governments, do you think the numbers of uh, tax evasion is going to increase because of the informality for that lack of trust into the government that is capable to actually distribute correctly uh, the taxes? That's my question. Thank you. Uh, ultimately, the uh, characteristics and structure of economic policy is determined by the political system. So if you think that the characteristics of economic policy are unsatisfactory, you're really criticizing the political process generating these results. Now, in the area of monetary policy, most people would agree that monetary policy has improved considerably by taking away responsibility from the political system and putting it in the hand of independent central banks. I'm wondering whether something similar could be conceived for fiscal policy design. Yeah. And if you are afraid that this yeah. bypasses the democratic process, you could always uh, postulate that the government can always override the decisions of these experts groups. And I think you could argue that such a process would improve both transparency and accountability of policy making. What do you think about this? So we have two more questions before I pass it on. I'll take two, one, okay. Yes, please go on. Hi, thank you. Um, I just have uh, two very brief questions. Um, you talk a lot about um, tax evasion and the amount that it represents, and it sounds like, I, I, if I remember correctly, it was around 335 billion. Um, this is an important um, uh, figure, especially in the face of the challenges of SDGs, and piggyback on your question from my colleague here, uh, we didn't talk a lot about, or we haven't talked a lot about informality in the in the region, which is a big, big um, challenge, and also about the risk, uh, the perception of risk, the perception of being caught. Like, what are the tax administrations doing to, um, um, you know, deepen more the the perception of of, of being caught and and not paying taxes. This is something that is in our culture and it's very, very deep in our culture. And the other question is, uh, can any of the panelists talk a little bit more about the tax uh, in the digital services? Thank you. So one more question from this side. This gentleman, yeah. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Philip Dever Dimitriad and I'm with Chevron. I have a question for you. When you talk about sustainable development goals, one of my uh, questions come back to how can the commitment to the SDGs facilitate uh, the expansion of the tax base and what would the specifics on this in terms of policy look like? I think in particular of corruption in one of the SDGs as we all know is uh, rule of law and strong institutions. So I can't help but feel that it would be a perfect marriage to talk uh, not just from the national level but from a regional one as well about addressing and really uh, moving forward on the SDGs. And then as a follow up to that, what role is there for the private sector to play in this? Thank you. Thank you. So why don't I start with Alicia and then we can go down and I think 
Nancy, first Nancy, because yes, she has Nancy. to leave. Yes, with yeah. apologies, because no, I need please. to leave, and I'm going to miss the chance to say hello to no, all, all the Latino aficionados in the room. I just want to say one thing about the politics. And I think CEPAL has an opportunity to change the politics in the following way. Just what we need in Latin America is some of the really rich people and big corporations to come out and beg to be taxed. This is happening finally in the USA. Eli Brode, Warren Buffett, and so on. So one way to attack the politics is for the most local institution, CEPAL, of all those sitting up here, to go forcefully on some of these issues of inequity, on the issue, I disagree completely with Vito, by the way. I'm glad <laughs> Teresa said that. The one thing that has changed in 50 years is we have evidence and data. And so we know that some poor people are being immiserated. But anyway, I'm only taking, I've already gone over my 15 seconds. Please consider a major report with a couple of specific goals around the tax systems, the inequities. Of course, expenditures are there, people will sleep, but just really go in for the problem of inequality and what needs to be done and push it hard for a couple of years and set goals and, and push the IMF too. Has the IMF done enough? I don't think so. Sanjeev says yes, yes, yes. No, in Sanjeev's work. work. <laughs> but operationally, how many people in operations in the... Anyway, let me stop there. And thank there you, you all very much. <laughs> wonderful to see you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you. Thank really. You. Thank you. Thank you. To be in your room. An so, honor. Alicia. Why don't we take everybody and I'll come at okay. the end. Uh, Marcelo. Yeah, let me try to... It's not an answer. Who am I to give answers to, to all of you? But uh, uh, a view on trying to put together uh, several of the comments on VAT, <laughs> informality. I think what the region needs is a strategy to combat informality, a true strategy. And I can see a strategy that would make Victor happy, would make Nancy happy. There's a strategy that you take seriously, indirect taxation, as a main way for you to collect revenues. And you take seriously a personal income tax a system as a way to redistribute back to the people. So if you do that, then you're saying basically to whoever is informal, please declare your income. Be formal because you're going to get a payback because you're know, you going to get some, some uh, uh, reimbursement from the federal government for all the indirect tax that you pay. And then you keep pro social programs that are targeted um, to the poorer to kind of ameliorate whatever effect the indirect taxation is caused that is buggy Nancy, and I think she has a point. So the, the problem, like Teresa said, is that it's not, this is not a rational debate. It's all about politics. So we didn't talk much here about uh, social security reform, but look at the case of social security reform in many of these countries. Take Brazil, there's like a case that I know better. It's, I think it's the biggest negative income trust program in the planet. I mean, there are people in Brazil, they're 53 years of age, they're public servants, they retire with 100% of their wage. And that's many multiples of the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. This is a scandal. This is a, it's simply a scandal. So, I mean, so how do you deal with that? It's the politics, because the moment you say you wanna do social security reform in that country, you have people against, that would benefit from the reform. They, they think you're taking a right of anyone. It's just a matter of dealing with the equity. So Latin America is about equity policies, I think. It's, and, and the issue of informality, I think, hits the issue of, of, of government uh, revenues directly. And the way to deal with it is to have a concerted uh, policy. I have, a, I have my preference, but you know, maybe you guys have a better solution for, for the issue. Thank you, uh, Marcelo. Uh, Eric? Yeah, sorry, I will start completely trying to complement the idea of Marcelo's in terms of the allocation. Remember that we have the discussion about allocation uh, inefficiencies. There is also a big allocation inefficiency regarding how much spend we have to the old vis-a-vis -vis the young people. Mm -hmm. Latin America and the Caribbean is a very young uh, population. We have a very young population. 
But the problem is that we are spending like we are a null population and a rich uh, continent. And, and, and I have the numbers. In lack, governments spend on average four more times on the old than on the young. Uh, and, this is, and the number is peak for Brazil, which is seven. And if you make a comparison with the US, it's just two. So this is the huge inefficiency again regarding uh, how much we pay uh, to, to the old vis-a-vis -vis the young. This is one, one issue. There are a lot of common questions in terms of uh, tax collection and, and so on. And I think I will sum summarize my answer with a concept from, from you uh, regarding trust. Uh, I think trust is the key component in terms that if people don't trust their governments, if people don't trust their markets, their companies, their politicians, it's very difficult to say, I'm going to pay taxes. Because I'm going to pay taxes, and what I'm going to get, I'm not going to get probably anything. Because governments are spending really badly in terms of they, they are inefficient, or they have targeted uh, different groups. And, and that's, that's an issue. So I think we should improve trust in, in governments. We should, should improve trust in, in markets. I think that's a common issue that we have to work on. There was a question regarding the, the political system and the idea of to have independent institutions like the, the central bank. I think the central bank is a really good example to have a, a very independent institution and nobody challenges that idea. It took some time, but I think we, we, are, we are there. The same is happening with uh, regulatory bodies like uh, uh, regulation uh, the, of banks, of uh, insurance companies, pension funds, and so on. And I think we have to work also on fiscal institutions. There are some countries that have already some uh, independent councils to, to provide advice to governments regarding fiscal policies, fiscal stance, but it's not executive. It's only, uh, they only have an advisory role. On the tax issue, I think that's more problematic. I think we need national consensus. I think it's a joke to change tax codes every two years. Mm -hmm. uh, to be frank, this is, this is incredible. Uh, that's why you need national consensus, and you need political courage to say, OK, we have to make those changes, and it has to last at least for 10 years. And finally, there was a, a question regarding uh, digital services. Uh, I think we are running um, a different race between innovators and, and technology companies vis-a-vis -vis regulators or tax administrators. They are running, the, the former, they are running uh, a 100 meter race. The other guys, including myself, because I was a, a previous uh, banking regulator, we were running a marathon. And this is nothing wrong per se, but times have changed. So now we have to change that, and what we, now we have to talk regulators and innovators to try to come up with a solution. And of course, we have to tax all digital services. And we have to make an agreement, not only in terms of a, a, a local discussion, but also a global discussion. And I think in that case, multilaterals uh, are important for the discussion. Go ahead. Um, two final points. One on the one is very technical, and the other one on the politics. The very technical one is that uh, Sepal made it very clear that we are way behind in collecting income taxes. But I think what we definitely need is a shift of less corporate and more personal. And on the more personal, one of the key reasons why we don't collect more. Uh, besides enforcement, is that the, the minimum threshold from which we start collecting is very high. Okay? You can definitely push it down. In, in, in some countries in Latin America, it's 100% of the income per capita. Whereas in China. in Europe. There you go. So uh, you have to push that down and combine it with progressivity in rates. That's, that's a very simple recipe. On the politics, um, on the point the gentleman made on the comparisons with, uh, with monetary policy, 
Um, I don't think we can go that far because, uh, as you know, central bank independence is being challenged because of the lack of uh, democracy uh, in, 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 in the way central banks operate. Uh, but I, uh, there are some issues that can be done uh, with fiscal rules, for instance. But I wanted to stress one point, uh, which is one of the successes of the monetary policy frameworks, which is not being talked much in the fiscal arena, which is communications. Um, Nancy said it very clear. We have the technical uh, wherewithal. We know the numbers. We know the issues. We, we haven't have known them for 50 years. The politics is the problem. Communication is key to bridge from the technical side to the politicians. And, and, and it is the role of local institutions, think tanks, civil society, to, to, to have very clear ideas on these things and push the messages uh, uh, forward as much as they can. Thank you, Jorge. Um, Alicia, no, the, yeah. Thank you so, so much. We have about five minutes left. Sure. So, yeah. I want to thank everybody because the, this session has been incredibly important also for my team because I think we will be able to, to look at the next report with critical eyes. But let me quickly say, first of all, I think you are right, Jorge, when you talk about the three different subregions, I think we cannot put them all in the same basket. I guess that the problems of Central America and Mexico and the problems of South America are completely different, honestly, because South America has much higher even income taxes than, than uh, Central America and Mexico. So the comparison there is, is not going to work uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, they have a productive structure that is also very different because in South America they're more relying on primary and, and you know, commodities and so forth, so that's also impinging on the economy. Now, that's number one. Number two, I guess inequality, and here I must admit that I think inequality has, has improved in the region for the first time in the history of the region. Honestly, the inequality indexes have changed from 2002 to 2014, I would say inequality went down and I think this is good news. Um, and, and I think it was basically because, more, more importantly, in South America and in the rest of the region. And it was because public policies were applied, because tax reforms were, were done, and, 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 and I would say minimum wages were, were put forward. Mexico, no. Mexico has never risen their, their minimum wages until this year. And it was so minimum. Still, the minimum wages of Mexico are very low. Anyway, but. What I would like to say is that there is improvement. So I, I don't agree with Vito that nothing has changed. I think a lot of things have changed. And I also believe that we have to look at wealth for the following reason, and, and income, income and wealth, both. Corporate taxes is an interesting component that I think we have to look at it. We haven't, and we should. But let me put you an example in Central America, just for you to know. The three countries of the Northern Central America, the ones that are migrating today, they have a difference of salaries between the U.S. and them 10 times. So how can you tell a person in Honduras not to migrate if the salary is 10 times higher in the U.S., for example? And, and, and honestly, well, that's very difficult to, 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 to hold these people back. So, and, and the other thing is, how do you, uh, in certain way, I think that politics is in the middle of this, no question about it, but these people, for example, in Central America, the income of the 10% of the, yeah, the 10 percent higher income is 70 times more than the 10% of the lower. 70, seven zero times. So how do how you deal with that? You know? So we definitely have to, and this is income. Now when we go to wealth, let me tell you, in Mexico, the genie of wealth is 0 0.8. We are measuring it. In, in, in Uruguay, which is the most egalitarian society, is 0 0.82. In Colombia, the, the land, uh, the genie of the land of, of in, in the rural areas, 0 0.9. So it's not only focusing on wealth, I'm sorry. It's focusing on patrimony, who has what, and where is it distributed. So I think we have to look into that. The, the third point I want to make is that informality. I definitely agree with you. We are working on informality. We know today that 53% of the people in Latin America and the Caribbean are not covered by social protection. They are in the informal sector. So now we're trying to find out where are they? What are they doing? 
What are they working on? Is this possible to formalize them in what, in what form? So because we're talking about 53%. We are also working on the pensions. Now, the, the, as you said very well, Teresa, the problem is the political, the political economy. The governments are trying to sell the pension reform as a social reform. Wrong. It's a fiscal reform. Brazil or, or Chile, they're trying to say, oh, we are going to protect the elders and the young and the whatever. Mentira. They're working on, it's fiscal. It's fiscal and, that, and, and the people are not buying it, but it's true. So we have done a, a book that I hope will be released soon and maybe Sanjeev, we can present it here, comparing the pension systems of all Latin America and the Caribbean, including Brazil. And it's very good because you can see there the cost and the problems. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, somebody talk about trust. Let me tell you, we did a study with OECD where we show that 64% of the Latin American people don't believe on their governments. They think their governments are corrupt and they are not doing what they should be doing. 64%. 52% of the people don't want to pay taxes. Their tax morale is low. Why? Because they say, why should I pay taxes if the government is not going to do anything for me? So those are the numbers that we, we, the institutions that are here, should be thinking about. And we should have, I think, a, a big debate, and I hope we will, on how the IMF, uh, the IDB, the World Bank, and us can work together to bring up these issues at the highest political level because we are still doing the traditional thing. Example, we're going to have a meeting with all the ministers of finance of Central America um, at the end of this month. And what I want to tell them is, guys, what are you going to do with migration? I'm sorry to say this. It's also their responsibility. So what are these governments going to do with, I mean, with the migrants that are moving, moving, moving? Yes, of course they're moving because the young people from between 25 and 35 years old don't find employment. They don't have opportunities because violence, because, you know. So how are we, the economy? And this is a, a question I have for Jorge, actually. I know there's no time, but I would like to know what is the IMF suggesting for the engines of growth? Because you are suggesting very well to, to you know, to the primary, you know, uh, we have to increase the primary expenditure and so forth. But um, what is the trade-off? Because we're going to increase the primary uh, or avoid the primary deficit, fine. Do we, and you say we have a social floor, very good. But how do we finance growth? How, how, what are going to be the engines of growth for the future? Uh, I, I think we, no, we don't really have the time. Sorry. Oh. I live oh, there. So, okay. No, no. See, so, well, I, I think the reason is. Uh, I'm sorry. We are, uh, I can answer in private. <laughs> sorry. Uh, but, it's okay. So, um, uh, Alicia, thank you so much with your uh, remarks, and uh, thank you for to the panel as well. Uh, I'm not going to summarize one because there's so many issues that oh, yes. came up, and uh, but one thing that stands out is. Uh, the political economy of reform. I think that is an area where we need to do a lot more thinking and, and, and uh, research. Um, but before I conclude, I just want to announce another event that uh, we are organizing uh, on Latin America next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Uh, it is, uh, uh, we call it CLAF, which is Latin American Financial Community. And they will discuss trade tariffs and economic growth in Mexico. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, it's a um, uh, committee that is run from here. And so um, you are, any of the people here who are interested in, in this topic are most welcome to, to come. So with this remark, I'd like to thank the panelists. And I'd like the, uh, everybody to give a round of applause for Thank you. Sorry.